I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Thousands of students are getting ready to return to college campuses around the region. We'll find out about new initiatives at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Opioid and other drugs are a growing problem in the region. Tonight we will find out about an initiative substance abuse recovery program. And we'll have the week's top economic stories from Business North. It's all coming up next on Almanac North. Well, hello and welcome once again to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, this is a big weekend for activities with students heading back to school this week at many colleges. Hard to believe that the summer is at that point when the students are coming back. Well, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> and back to school is the subject of our very first topic. Let's get started. All right. Thank you, Danny. Next Tuesday, students at the region's largest university will be moving into their home away from home. Move-in day is always a big day in a college student's life, and UMD is ready to roll out the welcome mat for new and returning students. They also have new campus initiatives that will factor into student life. Joining us with more is Lindley Lynn Black, the chancellor at UMD, and Lisa Irwin is vice chancellor for student life at UMD. And welcome. Thanks to both of you for being here at what I imagine is uh, a busy ramp up week for you. <laughs> it's, it's busy. We're ramping up, but it's a, it's a joy. It's always an exciting time when we start a new academic year. Mm -hmm. You've been here a few years now, Chancellor. What is it about the, the move in that still gets you excited? Well, it's many things. Uh, first of all, we really enjoy meeting the parents as well as the students. Uh, we do an exciting thing at UMD. Uh, the administrators and faculty actually help the students move into the residence halls. Huh. Okay. So when the cars pull up uh, full of uh, student belongings, uh, I'm out there and help them unload their vans and greet <laughs> their parents and uh, get to know them a little bit. And it, it's a way to hopefully help them feel more welcome. And also we think it's important that they should know who the administrators are. Mm -hmm. Lisa, and, I've heard big news about the UMD Medical School. The population, student population is swelling. <laughs> Our, our medical school enrollment as yes. well as the overall enrollment is looking really good for this fall. Okay. I said, uh, today, do they have the uh, white jacket ceremony at the med school? Oh, yeah, I believe they did. Yeah. I believe they did. And yeah. uh, the population is up. Uh, about how many, any idea how many students are in the medical school? They admit about uh, 63 students per year. I see. Okay. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. a two year program? Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it is. Okay, it is. Good. But our enrollment is extremely strong. I was going to ask you. And, about that. and uh, what we're most proud of, or one of the things we're proud of, is that uh, this year we had over 10,000 applications to UMD. It's the highest number of applications ever really? in UMD's history. And that's for about 2,200 slots for new students. Mm -hmm. So our reputation is, is great, it continues to grow, and, and we're really excited about the, the class that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lisa or, or Chancellor, either of you could answer this question. In the past, there have been some issues on move-in day with uh, rowdy parties, raunchy signs along yes. 21st. Uh, what's being done this year to kind of make sure that that doesn't happen and the welcome is a little more appropriate? Yes. We right? spent a lot of time in the fall, mm -hmm. with, especially with our students, yep. asking them about ways that we could change the culture because we agree it's really important to do that. So we've got a couple of really exciting things happening this fall. Our UMD Student Association, which is our student government, and my office are partnering on a Bulldog Yard sign contest. So we've got students signing up. We anticipate they'll sign up right up until Tuesday when the contest will be judged. And the Student Association designed the criteria. And we have uh, $1,200 in prizes, which will be grocery gift cards, which students always <laughs> need, uh, that will be awarded for creativity and school spirit. And uh, it's, we're really excited about that. Mm -hmm. The other initiative we have going is we invited our neighbors around campus who aren't students to put welcome signs in their yard so that students would know that they have uh, neighbors all around them. 
and we've had a really good response to that. And I'm personally delivering those signs on Sunday. Mm. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the population at UMD is, is one thing, but it isn't just about numbers at UMD. Tell us about uh, the school itself. What's happening with, all, you, with a variety of schools? What are some of the, the big subjects that uh, students might be looking to attend this fall? Well, we're continuing to add new degree programs at UMD that have an interdisciplinary character to them, uh, or they also uh, in some ways really apply to this region. Uh, for example, we have a new master's in tribal resource and environment mm. at, uh, at UMD. Uh, we have a new master's in advanced material science, uh, which also uh, keys into the new building that, that's going up, the uh, chemistry and advanced material sciences building. Uh, we have a new uh, bachelor's in integrated studies in our College of Education and Human Service Professions. We have a new uh, public history track in our history program. So I think, you know, we see students looking for those kinds of programs that might have an yeah. interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary function because that kind of training really helps them in their, in their careers. How, how's the pharmacy school doing? Uh, pharmacy's doing well. They, they continue to, um, uh, to move along, and that is a four-year program. Now, we don't really have a whole lot to do with the pharmacy and medical program, medical school at, at UMD. They're housed on our mm -hmm, campus. Right. They're great partners, great collaborators, but those are actually units of the Twin Cities mm -hmm. campus. So they, they don't report up through us, they report to the Twin Cities. But they're, they're great, great collaborators and great partners and we love having them. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the places in which UMD has been a leader has been in sustainability. I understand there's a, a free store for students moving in that kind of feeds into that reduce, reuse, recycle sort of a, a uh, I'm at a loss for words. Yeah. <laughs> it is new this fall, we're really excited about it. So as students moved out of the residence halls last spring, they had the opportunity to donate items that were gently used or used in, and could be used again uh, to, this, to our sustainability office who then organized all of those things into a free store. And so students, and we started with international students to kind of pilot it, uh -huh. and international students uh, really benefit from having those free things. They don't bring a lot from their countries, of course. So we tried it out, it's working really well, and we'll be able, and students will be able to come and get everything from microwaves to uh, yeah. rugs to mirrors, so it's a really exciting program. We also had some students involved in a project to put uh, solar panels on the Oakland Apartments, mm -hmm. one of our residence mm -hmm. halls, and uh, that's gone extremely well. Really has. You bring up apartments, uh, Lindley. Uh, is there still a need for additional student housing on campus? And even if there is, is there room to build? Well, there, yes to both of those okay. <laughs> questions. Sure. Uh, there is a need, there is room, and you wanna talk a little bit about the plans for housing? I would love to. So we are in the design phase for a new residence hall, oh. 280 to 350 beds, and it'll be on the opposite end of our residence hall corridor from Griggs. Iani is the new building on one end, and sure. we're hoping to put the other building on the other end. The other part of this project that is, that's exciting is it'll also have a dining component, because when you have more st student beds, you also need more places for them to eat. So uh, we got approval from the University of Minnesota uh, facilities folks to begin the planning and uh, we hope to uh, start breaking ground next spring. Mm -hmm. Chancellor, as you enter the school year, what are some of your goals for this academic year? Well, we're uh, focused on a number of projects. Uh, we've had a strategic planning process that we've been refining and that, that will be finished uh, this coming year. We also have a new initiative that's a national initiative looking at student retention and student graduation. Uh, we're working with uh, uh, 10 universities in the upper Midwest to really look at some of the roadblocks or challenges to students progressing throughout college and uh, finding and working together to develop uh, new, new strategies to help students be successful. So that's gonna be a, a new, new project as so well. So then how important mm -hmm. are student organizations within the campus that uh, help them move along in their academic year, not just with schoolwork? Well, they're extremely important. And, and most of our students who do the best are involved in co-curricular activities uh, beyond the classroom. But in addition to that, we, we have uh, outstanding academic advisors, counselors, uh, other personnel. Many of these are in student life, the area that uh, Lisa oversees, to uh, really focus on the whole student and focus on student well-being, mm -hmm. 
because it's, it's important for us that they are supported in every way possible to be successful. Do you give them support should they need some help, knock on your door and say, I'm having trouble here? Absolutely, and we have many people on the campus that are uh, uh, available to help. Back to student organizations, I wanted to mention that I'm really excited about the organizations that will be involved because it's an election year. So we have a number of organizations that will have full-on pushes for voter registration, which is wonderful for many of our students. It's the first time they ever got to vote. So we'll have lots of opportunities to register, and then we'll be working across the campus with faculty and staff to create voter education so students can edu get educated and get ready to vote. Mm -hmm. President Kaler has announced plans to retire. Is yes. that uh, going to have any impact on our local campus? Well, we'll we're obviously be looking for a new leader, so we'll Are we'll, you in the running? See. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am not. I'll make that very clear. I am not. I'm, I'm very happy where I am. But uh, there is a search process that's been started. Uh, Regent Omari is uh, heading up the, the search process. Uh, the goal uh, for the regents is to have a new president identified uh, by January. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, President Kaler is, we had a retreat with him, uh, his senior leadership team, we met with him uh, earlier this week and he made it real clear that he's gonna keep working uh, throughout the year. This is not a year that he's gonna take off or slow down. So. Uh, it's to still be very, very active. You were asking me about projects this year. Something else that we're very much involved in is uh, fundraising for UMD. Um, we are in the midst of a capital campaign, comprehensive campaign actually, uh, that uh, we announced publicly last, last fall. Uh, and actually this past fiscal year, we had the best fundraising year in UMD's history. Huh. We raised $18.1 million. Wow. And of course, the, the real big news at UMD is beer and wine for sale at hockey games. Now, well, right? there's, <laughs> there's that news as well. There's, and and, and uh, before we're done, we were talking about uh, the, 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 some of the issues oh. with the students coming in and some of the signs and parties and stuff that did not go so well. I really want to give uh, compliments to Mayor Larson and to the uh, Duluth Police Department and Duluth uh, Fire Safety. They've been outstanding partners with us on this. Mm -hmm. All right. And so we're gonna, we're gonna really ramp up enforcement as well as some of the activities mm -hmm. that uh, Lisa mentioned. All right, thank you so much. Good luck as the students move in and good luck as you get the school year started. Thank, thank you, it's you. always a pleasure to be with the two of you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Go Bulldogs. <laughs>
um, substance abuse, whether it be opioids or meth or heroin, over the past decade? Well, I've been in the area for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. and when I first came up here, we were having quite a bit of a meth issue. It's about 08, 09. And that sort of transitioned into an issue with synthetics. And that lasted for about two years, where it was pretty bad, until the last place on earth got shut down, and then it really dried up. Mm -hmm. We didn't start having the heroin issue until the pills got cracked down on. This is probably around 2012, mm -hmm. when all of the opiate prescribing, uh, there was a lot more regulation, a lot more um, focus on that. And so when the pills dried up, we had a lot of people who were addicted to pills and dependent on them who were in tremendous pain from withdrawal and switched to heroin at that time. And so most recently, we moved into our heroin phase, where, of course, we've heard about um, overdoses, especially among some of the young population. And uh, we are, however, seeing meth come back. Um, it's been pretty strong, and it's uh, actually to blame for a lot of the rise in crime, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's an expensive habit, and um, it takes over before you know. Yeah. And so the that's just where say, we're at. The just say no attitude of 30 years ago really doesn't seem to be working. Are we getting a handle on drug addiction at all in this country? Well, we're different, definitely reframing the way we think about it in the medical field, which is that it's not something you get over. It's a chronic illness, and it needs to be treated as a chronic illness, which is going to have relapses and, uh, re and remissions. Mm -hmm. And so we're really changing our thought process about that, and that's completely uh, re rejuvenating our approach to how we treat it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what would you consider innovative in the approach that your facility has taken toward um, substance abuse recovery? I'm trying to figure out how to say the least uh, amount because there's so much I want to <laughs> say about it. Uh. Um, one of the things about being the healthcare center is that we have integrated care. Mm -hmm. And so when our people come to us to get a chemical dependency assessment, uh, we're evaluating them for their medical needs, behavioral health, substance abuse, dental, and we can do all of that in-house. And so a lot of our people who are chemically dependent haven't been to a doctor, they haven't had a blood panel, they haven't uh, been to a dentist uh, in many, many years. And part of that is their fear. And so when we're meeting them, we're asking about all sorts of things and not just the medical dental aspect, we talk to them about food insecurity and housing and trying to make sure that they have their needs met in a number of different areas. And it's in a way that I haven't been able to do before outside of a, healthcare, of a health clinic like this because I only had access to a small amount of the services and we had to refer out. And our, our patients really love be, us being able to communicate with each other and work together. And I think that is gonna make a huge difference for our people. Are, no. are all patients treated at the center as outpatients? Correct, yeah, we're outpatient uh, facility for uh, medical, behavioral health, uh, dental, and substance abuse. Do you have uh, recommendation power, or whatever you might call it, to recommend that they see, uh, seek uh, uh, more serious treatment or in-house treatment? We have great community partners, and you so do. we work closely with both of our large healthcare systems. Uh, as well as lots of other uh, treatment centers in the Twin Ports. And so that's another beautif beautiful piece of the work we do is the community connections we make. So we don't want to duplicate services. Mm -hmm. We want to fill the gaps that our community needs. Mm -hmm. Are there some advantages to outpatient treatment versus a, a, a residential approach? I Absolutely. Think, I think so. Um, I think that, that the idea that people have is that everybody needs to go to inpatient. And part of that is, that they need to feel, want to feel safe, they want to get away from their environment, and I think that there's some benefit to that. However, the hard part is when they come home and they're in their same environment with their same people around them. And so I do think that outpatient can be really effective for a lot of people. It, it is a matter of having uh, contact with patients very often, sometimes daily during the week, having plans about what they're gonna do in the evenings, on the weekends, holidays, so that we're really talking about their real life and this isn't an imagined future, this is really what's happening today, tomorrow, with their kids, with whatever it is that's happening. And so I think that um, having the guidance while they're in their environment is really important for recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand that you're also uh, involved in a diversion program for first-time drug offenders working with the Superior Police Department. 
I don't know which one of you would. That would be me. Okay. okay. Talk um, about that and why why that might be a better solution than incarceration. So um, we're extremely lucky to be mm -hmm. working with Superior Police Department. Chief Alexander and I have been on a coalition together for many years, and it's his opinion, and I agree, that we can't arrest our way out of the problem of addiction. And while they want to hold people accountable who are bringing the drugs into our community and distributing them, he wants to offer treatment to addicts who need it. And so we'll be announcing uh, the diversion program soon, I believe, um, hopefully to be starting in mid-September, where we're gonna be able to offer people treatment um, instead of going to jail. Mm -hmm. It's almost like county jails have become the first step in treatment, if you will, yeah. because there are so many people who are drug users who are arrested for using the drug, for possessing the drug. That's very true. Um, the, the jails are becoming detox centers, and it's a very hard on the jail staff. That's not what they're there for and what they're trained for, and it is a very rough withdrawal for people. Um, and while the medical staff who are in the jails are, are working very hard to help people through it, it's difficult and it's not, um, it's not a great setup. And often they're released with, without the aftercare they need, and so it's a cycle and they go right back into using. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that Doc also creates the risk then for uh, overdose and death right. too. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doctor, what, how important is early intervention when you're dealing with substance abuse and what are the keys to really helping people recover and get on that right path? Very important for us to be focusing mm -hmm. on, on prevention because in everything we do in primary care that's key to most things. And so we're really working hard to make sure that we're doing all we can to screen um, to catch um, folks maybe at the, when they're at high risk but before they have an addiction disorder. And so that's something we're working on at the health center still improving on is how do we pop, how do we screen our population? How do we get our community screened so that we can catch things early and, and make their lives better? Mm -hmm. Now the Deputy, Secret Deputy Secretary of U.S. Health and Human Services visited your facility. Um, seems to think that the battle can be won with programs like yours. Are you seeing federal support to, uh, to help those of you who are working on the front lines? Thankfully we are. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, HRSA, the Human Resources and Services so Administration, I think I got that right, <laughs> who funds us uh, is very, very motivated right now to provide us with grant funding to expand our treatment oh. of substance abuse and behavioral health, which is what our community cries out for um, as one of the top needs right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you ladies yeah. both for coming in and Appreciate talking about it. the program and maybe once the, the intervention program gets a little bit more or the diversion program gets a little bit more off the, off the ground, we'll be able to have you come back and talk about that. Absolutely. Betsy, All Dr. Right. Emily, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it very much. Time for the business news from the editors at Business North. The Entrepreneur Fund and Great River Energy have formed a partnership that will help businesses grow in the region. Great River is providing $1 million for development with the Entrepreneur Fund contributing, distributing the money and servicing the loans. The financing will be available in rural areas served by Great River's cooperatives in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Great River's manager of economic development said the company wants communities in its coverage area to thrive, have good job opportunities, and offer a good quality of life. A study conducted by the Wisconsin Commercial Ports Association finds the ports have a big economic impact. The study says the port's annual economic impact is $1.4 billion, supporting more than 7,400 jobs. The study analyzed Wisconsin ports on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan. Additionally, the study says ports generate $241 million in federal, state, and local taxes, plus $480 million in personal income. Three shipyards in Wisconsin, including Fraser in Superior, employ 2,200 workers, 
with an annual payroll of $107 million. Ground was broken Wednesday for a $30 million retail development in Hermantown. Platinum Properties is constructing Hermantown Marketplace, shops between Quick Trip and National Bank of Commerce. It's the third major development Platinum has constructed. In 2006, it began work on Hermantown Square and in 2014 launched Sugar Maple Crossing. The first new structure will be anchored by Western Bank. Lake Effect Vapor also will be a tenant. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. We're nearly out of time, but you can still call if you have a comment. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org and visit the new improved WDSC website for a fresh look at our program schedule, news about your favorite PBS shows and happenings here at the station. Plenty of activities in the region this weekend, Julie, including a host of county fairs in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Now, are you someone who enjoys going to fairs? I haven't been to a county fair for a while, but I, I loved fairs. Still do. I think they're a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I like the animals. Yeah, I always see my neighbors there. <laughs> <laughs> for Julie and the crew at WDSC, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.